Thank you. It's so great to be here and two, two good acts to follow with Sir Ken and Alexander. Um, I would like to um, talk to you a little bit about raising the next generation by inspiring students in STEM. A um, little bit about what we do here in the School of Science in collaboration with colleagues in the School of Education and in the School of Engineering and Technology and a partnership that we have that's called UCASE, which is the Urban Center for the Advancement of STEM Education. And shown here are just a couple of the pictures that we'll be talking about. See if I go forward here. Oh, so as Mike has already gone through, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. And I'd like to tell you three stories that relate to inspiring students in STEM and um, relate them to some things that we're doing at IUPUI. Now, just if I could see a quick show of hands, how many people are students right now, are our own students right now? So we have a fair number of our students, but we've all been students. So I would like to go through kind of a progression of things, but first, I would like to tell you just a little bit about me and um, one of the classes I teach. So I teach freshman biology here at IUPUI. Um, as Alexander has said, there's a lot to uh, thinking about how science works. And I think that we, I teach in a classroom a lot like this. It's twice as big. It's the one over in lecture hall that you probably know. And in my class, we talk about things like stem cells. We talk about cellular respiration and how our bodies break down food for energy. Talk a little bit about diseases like cystic fibrosis and cells in the lungs that are involved in um, uh, this particular disorder. We talk about how organisms start out as one cell and within a couple of months have trillions of cells, the process of cell division. We talk about the vast diversity of life on Earth, which by and large is microbial, all single-celled organisms. And we talk about, of course, the amazing you know, structure of DNA. So our course in biology focuses on many kind of common themes. And I feel that we're very fortunate at IUPUI, truly. We have some of the very best students in the state. I honestly mean that. We have amazing students. and But they all got to IUPUI in different places and through different routes. So I'd like to tell you a little bit. So here's the first story. First story, I hope you all agree, is kids typically love STEM. If you have kids, you know, we've all been a kid, um, pretty much kids really enjoy the idea of working with things with their hands, asking questions, you know, laying down in the grass and looking at bugs, whatever it might be. And a Harris poll that was actually done recently by the Gates Foundation showed that if you queried students, if you asked students about their favorite subject at school, really at all levels, um, they, they said things like art and music, you know, were way up there. Kids love that and PE and things like that. They love a lot of subjects, but kind of surprisingly, you know, math is way up there for kids. And we're talking about young kids and older kids. And if you add all the STEM disciplines in there, which is, you know, their biology or earth science or chemistry class, their 31% of the kids say that their favorite subject in school is STEM. And if you ask them the average age that their interest in STEM began, it's pretty young. It's a kindergarten, first grade, second grade. So kids, their interest is sparked probably even before they're in school, a lot of the early events that shape their life. And then when they get into school is the ideal time to do this. Why? Why would kids like STEM? You know, why do a lot of us like STEM? Even if you're not a science major, as Alexander was saying in, his, in the previous talk, even if you aren't a science major, science is very creative. It's very interesting. Um, there's, there's things where you're doing STEM and you're not even realizing it, or you're in, interested in science, computer games. Um, your parents take you to museums. Teachers uh, do activities with you. A lot of times it involves technology. So there's an awful lot of reasons to like STEM. However, here's kind of the, um, the part of the story where we have to think about things. This pipeline picture shows kind of a 10 year window. It starts with kids who are ninth graders in 2001. That could have even been some of you here in the audience. So that would be the high school class of 2005. And there's about 4 million kids throughout the US, let's say, who were ninth graders in 2001. Only about 3 million of them graduated from high school. So that right there is a concern that we should all be you know, thinking about. Um, about two million of them were interested in going to college, so that's great. But another thing that maybe is a little disconcerting is that really only about a million and a half of those students were considered college ready to take the, the type of classes where they could succeed in college. Then we look at the skinnier pipeline, only about of the 2.7 million who graduated from high school, only about 277,000 are thinking about going into STEM. And then if we look six years later, 
We'd like to think that students would graduate in four years, but let's just say six years as a good window. Um, we, of the 277,000 that intended on being STEM majors, by the time they graduate, it's about 166,000. So this has definitely been recognized as a national crisis. When you look at that number, somewhere between four and 8%, you know, depending on where you sample that pipeline, where do you take that first one? I'm taking it from the ninth grader side there. But really only about four to eight percent of students will actually, of, of students in the U.S. will graduate with a career in STEM. And we know how important STEM is to the technological and economic future of our country and in the world place. Now, and this is not because of any shortage of talent. You probably know amazing kids. This is not one of our own students, but this was a story I was reading Scientific American the other day, and it was a team of high school students, and um, they're all under the age of 18. They started their own company. It's a gene delivery company, so they're trying to genetically engineer mosquitoes to develop um, uh, ways to perhaps fight malaria or something like that. So this was just published. So we obviously have a lot of talent in the high schools, in the middle schools, in the elementary schools. And so what can we do um, as college students, as faculty members, as members of the community? I don't know if there's any teachers here, but as teachers, I think there's at least one here. Um, what can we do? So President Obama recognized that this is a, a crisis. Um, just before President Obama was elected, there was a report put out by the National Academy of Sciences that was called um, Rising Above the Gathering Storm, recognizing that we really do have a crisis in STEM education. He spoke to the National Academies in April of 2009, and he made a great quote. And he said that I, he was talking to scientists. So he said, I want you, scientists, to go out into the classroom show young people what science is and why it's cool, what your work means and what it means to you. So he really encouraged scientists to do their part, not think that we only have to start thinking about kids in STEM when they get to college, but thinking much earlier than that. So he actually called for um, a new national initiative that's kind of underway for 100,000 STEM teachers and 1 million STEM graduates in the next 10 years. So I'd like to now tell you some things that we're doing here at IUPUI about that. Now, he was speaking to scientists to say, go into your local classrooms. And at the, about the same time, IUPUI had just started a program that did a, a version of this, not actually putting professors into classrooms, but putting a group of students in who um, I, I could say the next best thing, but even be a better, might even be a better thing. So this is a program that we've been running for the last five years at IUPUI called GK12. The G stands for graduate, and the K-12 stands for the K-12 community, the, the uh, pre, you know, high school, middle school, elementary school. Um, this program takes students who are, grad, who are takes graduate students who would normally be teaching maybe a biology lab or something as part of earning their graduate stipend. By day, or for most of the week, they're working in their research laboratories, they might be taking their own classes. But in the other part of the week, about 10 hours a week, 10 to 15 hours a week, they go out into the local schools and they serve as a scientist in the classroom. They bring their research in, they talk about things that they're working on, and they get the kids involved. So we've had 55 of these graduate fellows, or close to 55 graduate fellows who've done this program, and they work in areas that you might not think would um, interest high school students, but they definitely do, We are high school and middle school. So that includes health psychology, geochemistry, breast cancer research, biophysics. So again, these graduate students for most of the week and many evenings and weekends are working in their labs, but at least 10 hours a week, 10 to 15 hours a week, they go into their local schools. And what do they do? We don't just put them into local schools. We pair them with some of the teachers in this area. And we think that we have pretty amazing teachers that we work with. Three of them are shown here. And um, these are teachers who are really interested in bringing research into their classroom. And then shown in the larger picture is a, a group of these students who came to IUPUI recently. We try to do that whenever we can to the School of Science. But it's the pairing that's really important. It places a research scientist who may not know a lot of things about K-12 education in with a teacher who probably does know an awful lot about science, but maybe doesn't have access to the type of research projects that the graduate students do. So it's been an amazing program. Um, we've had 55 fellowships over the last five years. 
Uh, story number two, the other part of President Obama's message, besides scientists go into classrooms and tell everybody what this means to you, is he really realized that there's a need for about 100,000 new STEM teachers to meet the need. Um, one of the quotes that he said is, it's the quality of math and science teachers, and I would add also engineering and technology teachers in the high school. That's the single most important factor in determining whether a student's going to like those subjects. And that was another part of that Harris poll. If you ask kids, what was the most influential thing about why they liked STEM? You know, they didn't necessarily say that it was because of a museum trip or that was there, but the number one reason, even above parents, was their teachers. So teachers are extremely influential in um, helping a child explore science and think about how the world works. And he said at this, um, at this, this was in the State of the Union actually just a couple years ago, just a year or two ago, if you want to make a difference in the life of the nation, if you want to make a difference in the life of a child, become a teacher. Your country really needs you. So this was just in 2011. This picture from the press conference was actually back in um, 09 though. So let me just tell you a little bit about what we're doing here at IUPUI for this. So 100,000 teachers um, mean it is about 10,000 teachers a year for the next 10 years. So IUPUI uh, is responsible for a sliver of that. And I'm very proud of two programs that we have. One of them is called the Woodrow Wilson Indiana Teaching Fellowship Program. This is a program that's been funded by the Lilly Endowment for the last five years. And it um, tries to attract people into the profession of teaching who maybe have had another career. In this picture, are shown uh, in engineers from Intel, we have nurses, we have people with former military careers, and, and some are undergraduates as well who just wanted to pursue a career in teaching. So they are asked to think about becoming a teacher in a high need school. These are the schools that really need the best science and math teachers. And we put them through a very rigorous program. We call it a clinical residency. They spend an entire year in a classroom and then they become a STEM teacher in the area. Another program that we have is funded by the National Science Foundation and it's the Robert Noyes Teacher Scholarship Program. So this again, it attracts excellent students in all the STEM disciplines to teaching, uh, puts them through that clinical residency, and we have between our two programs, just over the last four years, we've prepared over 100 teachers. So definitely uh, leading toward that national effort. What do they do once they're out in the schools? We try to have our teachers bring that real life experience into the classroom. Shown as one of our Woodrow Wilson fellows who was just on the news on Wish TV a couple months ago for incorporating the idea of solar energy into a class project. And now the students are talking to the school board about uh, becoming solar in Sheridan High School. If I don't know if anybody lives around that area. And um, another um, initiative that we just did recently or that some of our teaching fellows did recently is to do a whole week long CSI activity at Crispus Attics just right across the street from IUPUI where they really got kids involved in all the STEM disciplines to think about how you would solve a crime. All right, story number three. And this story is now at the college level. So kids really love STEM. Um, we're trying to put good programs in place for them. But when you look over the course, now this graph goes over the course of decades, you can see that we are just barely holding ground and in some cases losing ground in terms of college science majors. This is another part of that leaky pipeline. So if you look at biology uh, majors in the green line there, um, the levels have not gone down as much, but if you look at how high levels were in computer science in the early 80s, that's when I was actually in college, computer science and engineering has gone down greatly. And if you look at that little people graph there in the corner, you can see that biology is about 50-50 women to men, actually a little bit more on the female side. But computer science and engineering have really, really low numbers of women. And that, again, women and underrepresented minorities, which is not shown on this graph, but again, we're missing out on the potential of half of all sci possible scientists when we have such low representation among certain groups. Um, why is this? Why do college students change their mind? There was an article in the New York Times that said, why? Because it's hard. It is a hard subject and um, the title of the New York Times article was that, it's so darn hard. But as you read the article, and I don't know if anybody's ever seen this, really it said that, or is it not interesting enough? You know, do we bring students into science and then sort of torture them with long lectures and don't give them a chance to really, okay, I see that, yes, <laughs> this might resonate with some of you. Hopefully nobody from my class, but who knows? And, um, <laughs> but really, you know, are we bringing it, and it's called the math science death march, kind of a, kind of a, 
severe term, you know, but really are we bringing them in, you know, just to see them march out again? Hopefully not, but you can see the statistics up there. 40% of students who plan STEM careers, 60% of pre-med students will change their mind, okay? So we need to do something about that. So. I'll just finish with the last couple slides. Our solution at IUPUI is to develop as many great programs as we can for STEM undergrads. So um, shown here in this beautiful pictures are women in science. We have a women in science house that's to develop a community for all of our many women in science students. We have another NSF grant that's called the STEM Talent Expansion Program. And it has one mission, little graduation cap there up in the corner, help our students successfully get to graduation. I won't even touch on all the things in here, but I'll just kind of look at these red uh, sections. So that has involved of getting new summer bridge programs and things like Women in Science House in place. Changing uh, classes around so they aren't just lecture. They have peer mentoring and they have all kinds of supports built in. Putting in career services so students can see the pathway to different jobs. And then helping our transfer and Ivy Tech, uh, you know, Ivy Tech and transfer students get over here successfully and be successful when they're here. Very last thing I'll mention is that um, another thing that we do for our undergrads is we try to do interdisciplinary research. This is an undergraduate research program that we're doing right now. It's funded by the uh, Transforming Undergraduate Education in Science program, NSF2s. And this brings um, organic chemistry, which is an upper level or, um, chemistry class where small molecules are made that are amino acids. And it brings them over to the biology classroom where we actually are looking at ways to develop drugs for cystic fibrosis a disease that it's called an orphan disease. It kills 200,000 people a year and um, there are really uh, not a lot of mechanisms to treat cystic fibrosis. So we're really involving our undergrads in true open-ended research. This is something that is similar to what's done at Eli Lilly in terms of drug discovery, and we do it here in the classroom. Okay, so looking ahead, what do we want to do to strengthen the path line? We want to strengthen the, the, the K-12 STEM teaching and learning. Another area that um, is just starting to hit the news, and you'll hear more, about, more and more about it, is helping students learn how to be computer scientists. This is, we're talking elementary and middle school students. There's a website called Code. Org. If you don't know how to code, check code.org out. It goes, it has lessons as early as uh, four-year-olds can start to learn some of the concept of computer science. Despite its really critical importance in the US um, economy, computing, all the IT uh, infrastructure, we have very few computer science uh, classes or teachers at the high school level, another thing that we're trying to work with. And then help strengthen the pathways at the college level. All right, the stories end. Um, our GK12 program, the NSF has run this program for 10 years. They are actually discontinuing this program, I'm sorry to say. So we're looking for other mechanisms to keep this great program going. Our Noyce and Woodrow Wilson teacher preparation, we hope those will continue and will keep making a difference in that 10,000 teachers. And then our step and twos, we're hoping to really improve that undergraduate curriculum so we don't see that huge attrition rate in our undergrads. Okay, I'll just leave there with a quote. I'll stop there, thank you.